Johnson. I'm Paul Cowling with Film Independent, and welcome to a bonus coffee talk. Uh, before we start, uh, I want to let you know that Film Independent is a uh, LA-based arts non-profit organization. You probably know us for the Film Independent Spirit Awards, which takes place the day before the Oscars, but we produce hundreds of year-round screenings and conversations, and panels and workshops. Uh, you can check out more at filmindependent.org. Membership is open to everyone. Uh, we have a special right now through the month of May. We have some specials for membership this week. And this week only, if you sign up for a year's membership, you get two months extra for free, uh, which works out at 16.67% extra free. I did the math. So, uh, yeah, go and check out us. Uh, check us out on filmindependent.org. Uh, today, uh, it's a bonus coffee talk with uh, a good friend of ours, writer, uh, Oscar nominated screenwriter for A History of Violence, uh, Josh Olson. Josh, welcome. Hi, Paul. Thank you for having me, man. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, um, you know, I, I uh, live in the life. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm on, a, on a micro level. I'm pretty much living the life I would normally be living. I'm working on two jobs, uh, so I'd be glued to my computer anyway. It's the part where I kind of step back and look at the world outside my house that um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, horrified and terrified and that I run back to my computer and... <laughs> Try not to think about it. You also host a podcast with Joe Dante, the movies <laughs> that made me. Uh, yes. you're, you're still doing that, right? Yeah, we are actually. It's a it's a great time to be a podcaster. Yeah. Um, it's the one thing about my life right now that uh, normally I'd have to drive to a studio to do the show, and now I just get to do it from here. So it's actually saving me time. Um, and we've and been doing can... a interviewing a lot of people regarding sort of pandemic picks, right? We're, we're yeah, sure. normally the show is uh, we bring on filmmakers and artists and, and sort of people whose work we're interested in and talk to them about the movies that have kind of formed them and informed them on their creative journey. Uh, but for the last six or seven weeks, we've been running specials on Fridays as well, um, sort of multi-guest episodes that are an hour and a half, two hours, where we bring a whole bunch of people who have been on the show on. And they run us through like lists of, you know, five movies or so, TV shows that have been helping get them through, you know, times of quarantine. And we've been using those to raise money for the Hollywood Food Coalition, which is doing amazing work uh, feeding homeless people, um, which, of course, is a you know, even more serious problem right now. And uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun because there's sort of two tribes of people. There's people who are coping with all this by... You know, watching, uh, you know, the pandemic movies, watching Contagion and, uh, you know, 28 Days Later and so forth and into the world stuff. And then there's people who are doing everything they can to run away from that. And a lot of people watching Singing in the Rain. I find. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I've been watching movies that were not pandemic movies, and when they start running, I'm like, this is a pandemic movie. I didn't realize I picked pandemic movies here. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like uh, Dog Tooth, for example. Like what? Dog Tooth. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, they're in quarantine. Yeah, yeah three, three kids who've never left the house in all their lives. I'm like, oh, I didn't. Yeah, of course. Quarantine movie. Really. Um, we'll get to your picks uh, okay. a little later. Um, I still reference you, actually, um, at several, many of our events when we have a no script policy. We ask people, you know, they can pick the brains of the guests, but don't please don't shove a script in their face. They won't read it because uh, they're too busy. And I reference your Village Voice article. Yes. Uh, now, um, seminal article. I will not read your effing script. Um, I'm paraphrasing here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do people still reference that? Yeah, it, it comes up all the time. Um, it, it seems like about once or twice a year, uh, somebody on Twitter discovers it or rediscovers it, and it, it gets a whole new life. Um, I remember shortly before he died, Roger Ebert uh, tweeted it out, and, uh, uh, which was which was lovely. Um, but yeah, it's it's I've sort of resigned myself to the fact that no matter what else I do in life, that's that's the thing that's going to go on my gravestone. Um, Josh Josh Olson, you know, lies here. Uh, he still won't read your fucking script. So. <laughs> I'd still urge people to read that so they could just see it from your perspective. And like, you make a lot of good points. It's like, I thank you. you. No, a lot of people were antagonized by it, I think. And I know, and, um, uh, you know, you can't call something that and, and then be mystified when people are annoyed by it. But, um, you know, the, the, the fundamental point that I think most people got that some people didn't is it wasn't, you know, I, I, I don't begrudge you, 
uh, you know, work. It's it's the part where people think it's okay to come up to complete strangers and ask them to do this stuff for them, which um, one of the things that, that uh, you know, I, I learned very quickly in the business. I started out working in crew. I was a PA, you know, and um, uh, I'd probably been in the business a month or two before I ran into somebody who was asking me to read scripts for them as though somehow being a PA on a movie meant I had a fast track to getting a film produced for them. And uh, I think it was just, you know, the, the nice thing about, um, well, I don't know, the thing with the article was that I sort of achieved a position where, you know, I could now write something like that and people would actually look at it. But, um, you know, the point was that it's, it's, it's a problem that I think everybody in this business deals with. It's not even this business. I have friends who are doctors and carpenters who are constantly getting asked to do free work. So, um, you know, I think uh, really uh, the, as well. Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I have a friend who's a carpenter who, would, who who loved the article. It never even occurred to me that that, that it would translate. But um, yeah, he was like, yeah, you meet some people, they have you over for dinner, they're being really nice to you, and you're like, huh? And then and then they take you on a tour of their house, and they always take you to the room where you know there's a big hole in the ceiling and. And now you know why you got dinner. And it's yeah, like, <laughs> you need some shelves. Yeah. 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 Oh, you're a doctor, are you? I yeah. have this pain in my shoulder. So. My appendix needs yeah, removed. Yeah. It. I mean, I think the whole thing, it's a little overwritten. It, 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 it was kind of a first draft. It sort of got away from me and got out there. But, um, you know, I think the, the short, my friend Harlan Ellison distilled it down to uh, don't be a schnorrer. And that, that pretty much says it all. Is. Uh, <laughs> Never a man to mince his words, Harlan. Yes, Harrison. that is true. Um, and you also mentioned that it's a great time to be uh, doing podcasts. And I yep. know that you recently, um, you wrote a um, dramatic podcast called Bronzeville. Yes. Um, which I think many of our viewers will know about, some may not. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Because it's uh, you have some news. Um, yeah, I'd love to. Um, to that, right? Yeah, Bronzeville was, uh, we actually just finished the second season. It's in post now, which may have been slowed down by uh, current events. Um, but the first season was a 10-episode audio drama, fully scripted, a la old-time radio. Um, it's, uh, we had an amazing cast um, and uh, uh, two of the leads are my producers, uh, Lawrence Fishburne, Lorenz Tate. We've got Tika Sumter, Omari Hardwick, uh, Tracy Ellis Ross, Wood Harris, I mean, just an incredible, this season we have Layla Hathaway and Mackay Pfeiffer. Um, and it's a very, very fictionalized um, version of uh, sort of the numbers rackets in Chicago in the 40s. It's about one family and a young man who comes to Chicago and falls in with them. And it was an incredible challenge when it came to me. It was, um, and I think my, my agent uh, at the time very candidly uh, presented it to me first as, you know, because uh, she knew I was a huge Fishburne fan. Uh, how'd you like to do a, a gangster show with Lars Fishburne? I was like, I'm in. And then it was like, oh, it's an audio drama. <laughs> and um, uh, it, it was an amazing challenge because, um, you know, I, I've spent my entire working life learning how to be, I like to think, fairly competent at telling stories uh, using visuals. And, um, you know, and, and like all screenwriters, I've developed an allergy to exposition. And all of a sudden you're in a medium in which there are no visuals, but exposition still kind of sucks. Um, you can't have two people walk into a room and go, say, Jimmy, there's a body over there on the floor with all that blood coming out of the, it must have been stabbed. You have to find ways to kind of deal with that stuff. Um, so it was a really fascinating challenge and it was probably more writing than I've ever done in a short period of time in my life. We had three months for the first season to do 10 episodes, which the scripts are all about 40, 40 to 55 pages each. And, um, it was it was really really tough work but really gratifying and then got to go in um a lot of audio dramas record the actors separately it's a little easier for scheduling kind of like animation but you right. can hear it you can absolutely hear it people sound like they're sleepwalking um we were adamant it, it's it's uh um all the actors are in the room every now and then somebody's talking to someone who's not there but never in a big scene and it, the actors loved it. It was so much fun being in the room with them as, you know, you'd literally park your car, you'd walk into a room, and a minute and a half later, you're doing scenes with Lawrence Fishburne. And um, 
it just it was an incredible incredible experience and the uh first season came out it did really well um i've never in my life gotten profit checks off of something i wrote that was fun and um we like i said we yeah 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 and uh i mean it was just it was just a joy all around easily one of the greatest creative experiences i ever had um and yeah so we just did a second season uh which should be coming out soon um i'll, I'll know more shortly and uh, that was incredibly fun too but i just i just absolutely fell in love with the medium it's um it's 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 so much fun to work in once you sort of get over that first hurdle you know it's basically harks back to the old radio shows of course yeah yeah exactly it's fun explaining that to people because it's like it's like no it it's just you know here here's the future the future is the past <laughs> it's old-time radio uh, was it always a pitch to you as a podcast yeah it it was um the company that did it had come to uh my then agency paradigm uh looking to do audio dramas and they asked them to give them like their five best most interesting uh tv pilot or tv series ideas and uh fish and lorenz um had this broad strokes idea and they said oh that sounds interesting find a writer and so i i got the call um but yeah i mean the the, the fun thing you know aside from the fact that it's a really entertaining medium and and a really fun way to tell stories for writers it's also a great way to um you know, essentially, uh, you know, create, create TV pitches because, um, you know, you, you end up with the most detailed TV pitch in history by the time you're done a season. Right. Yeah. As you said you're earlier, you're creating IP and suddenly yeah. you yeah. have an attractive product that people then want to take into a, back into a, a medium that you didn't choose to make it in. But yeah, exactly. exactly. And how do the actors love it? I would imagine that this is flexing their creative chops. They, I've... I've never seen, yeah, they, they, they loved it. I mean, everybody came in and just had the best time. It was, um, you know, it, it was so much fun to be around that energy, you know, as people came in and that realization that, you know, you're not getting paid to wait anymore. You know, there's no hair, there's no makeup, there's no set dressing. We did a scene in the second season, which was like, I think it was set in a restaurant and, and we did a take and I don't remember what happened. Somebody, we, we realized like, oh no, this should be in a, this should be in a pool hall. I was like, all right, take two. Now you're in a pool hall. Boom, go. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but they were they they loved it. They were they were uh they were phenomenal. And um um I remember uh uh you know the fish came in and just immediately um took to it and just you know got so passionate about what we were doing and uh you know it just the actors would just feed off of that. It was it was a blast. It was a blast. Yeah, because the focus now is on their voice and yeah. solely on their voice. Yeah, yeah. And they can't express themselves any other way. It's a yeah, and there, there's fun stuff you learn too. You know, it's like in casting, you start to realize, oh no, it's it's no longer. You know, it used to be you want you want to make sure if you have a scene with two characters that yeah, they look different. You know, so you can tell them apart. Yeah. Um, but now it doesn't matter what anybody looks like. But you want to make sure that people's tonalities are different. You know, if you have. You know, a scene with, if you have a scene with two guys who talk like this, it gets very confusing. What do you mean it gets confusing? I'm talking now. No, I'm talking now. So you have to kind of think about that when you're casting, which is a whole new thing. I hadn't thought of that, yeah. Because yeah. I, I noticed that in, um, like, radio uh, interviews where some, you know, the, you know, the interviewer will say their names so and you know who's talking. But, yeah, that's right. You can't. Like, you and I could do scenes together on an audio drama. It'd be fine. They can tell the difference. <laughs> Accents are great for that. <laughs> Why do you think there's this sudden um, sort of resurgence in dramatic podcasts and, and, and interest from listeners? Um, I, I think, I mean, there's a couple of things going on. One, I think people have just been inundated by, uh, I read something, I have no idea how much validity this has, that there's only so much space in our heads for visual input. And, and there's so much of it going on that people sort of like, your, your brain starts to get overwhelmed. Um, there's something about audio that's it it um, it activates parts of your brains that that watching TV and movies doesn't. You're um, you're sort of forced to lean into it a little bit to, to pay closer attention. Uh, there's also the simple thing of like you can do it in the car. You know, you can listen yeah. in your car. And um, I know that in uh, Australia, for instance, podcasts are huge, and that's a big uh, commuter culture. Um, but we're finding now during the pandemic that there's an awful lot of people still listening, even though they're not commuting anymore. So, is it? I wonder if the interest in podcasts has gone up uh, 
uh, exponentially with or at the same time as traffic and commute time. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, it may. It probably, it, world, so more people are listening to podcasts. Than, yeah, and the nice uh, thing, I think the improvement over radio is you still control it. You know, if like if, if Bronzeville was every day at 4 p.m. on some local radio station, you'd have to make sure you were, you know, available for that or in your car or what have you. But now it's, um, you know, it's, it's there waiting for you whenever you want it, which is nice. Um, I'm going to ask people to submit questions for later on, uh, but someone has said, asked a question already from Alexis and it's on this topic. So I'll ask it now uh, for the audio drama. Did you use the old audio dramas for research scripts and or listening to the old broadcasts? Well, I, fortunately I had grown up with a bunch of records. Um, when I was a kid, there was a sort of resurgence of interest in old time radio and you could get records and old cassette tapes of like old shows like the shadow. And I ate those up as a kid. So I was familiar with the medium. Um, I went back and sort of downloaded a few episodes of old ones, uh, just sort of random stuff. There was an old show in the 70s called CBS, I think it was CBS Mystery Theater uh, that E.G. Marshall hosted, where they sort of brought back audio drama in the, in the modern era. And I, um, I loved those as a kid. So I listened to a few of those. I, I didn't read any scripts because it didn't, um, uh, I don't know, I'm sort of a maniac about that. I, I don't like reading scripts. I feel like... Um, when I'm when I'm writing, I'm aspiring to write a movie, not a screenplay, or a you know an audio drama, not a screenplay. So it's just my stupid brain. But um, so I basically used a screenplay format, and then just sort of wrote from there. We would still use slug lines, just with the understanding that every piece of information you're putting down that isn't that isn't dialogue has to be something that can be conveyed via audio. Uh, if that makes sense, you know, so it's like he steps outside. Okay. We're going to hear a door opening. It's raining. We're going to hear rain, you know, um, yeah, that you have to that into the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Sure. And then it was funny for the first couple episodes, I was precious. I was writing it as though, you know, Jimmy steps outside and it's raining. And then, you know, by the end I was like, I was like, okay, we need audio going from the left channel to the right channel to convey that he's walking across a room. You're just sort of laying it out like a blueprint at that point. But yeah, you, you, you script all that. Sure. Yeah, and sound effects now become yep. a key part of the. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We had a great uh, engineer, director, mad genius, Casey Whalen, who has um, actually written a book on on doing this stuff. But uh, uh, he did a phenomenal job um, with uh, with the the audio and the sound effects. Um, so people can find Bronzeville on all good podcasting. Yeah, outlets. it's 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 out there. It's all you know. It's iTunes, everything else. It's Bronze B R O N Z E Ville. Um, and it's a real place, right? Outside of Chicago. Yes, it is. It's outside of Chicago. Got to, got to go there after it was, it was such a tight schedule. I didn't get to go there beforehand, but after the show had come out, uh, we did a, we did an event there and it was amazing going there and meeting people who had grown up in the era we were writing about and who loved the show. It was just really gratifying. Um, a lot of it, by the way, I should mention, I had a, I had a, a friend who's a, a history fanatic named Michael Theobald, who was, um, we got to hire him as a historical consultant. So at like three o'clock in the morning, if I was stuck at a scene and, you know, I was like, I, I, I need to know about some banking revel re you know, regulations in Chicago in 1947 and get up two hours later and he'd have sent them to me. So that, that helped. <laughs> <laughs> and season two is, um, imminent, imminent. imminent. Yeah. It is done. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that all, led to, I mean, are we going to talk about the, the thing that led to, or should I let you guide me there? It's up to you. <laughs> Cause, uh, um, yeah, I, I had such a good time doing that, that, um, uh, I, w I wanted to sort of pursue the, the media more and, um, uh, a good friend of mine is Alison Anders, uh, the great filmmaker. And she had a, she had a TV series that she, uh, wanted to do that, um, she had listened to Bronzeville and enjoyed it. And she, she asked if I'd take a look at uh, her pilot and, you know, would this make a good audio drama? And I said, it'll make a great one. I'd, I'd love it. And she goes, would, would you like to produce it? And I've never produced in my life. And, um, but I was like, sure. Yeah, why not? And we ended up, um, uh, it was great. We, we attached uh, Emily Deschanel uh, is going to be the lead to a show called Ashland. And we took it around to all the different companies that were doing this. And, they they kept making the same offer, which which was really frustrating. It's like, you know, podcast money is podcast money. You're not going to get rich up front doing it. But they all wanted to do mountains and mountains of notes and, and on, on outlines and on scripts. And, and our feeling was, you know, if we're going to be doing something like this, 
it can only be a labor of love. You can't be doing it for, you know, the, the money. And if you want to get us at our best, you're, you don't, don't develop us. You know, we don't want to do rounds and rounds of notes. It's like, you gotta, um, and, and that realization that they were all kind of doing it that way, uh, led me to go to a friend of mine, Steve Bing, who's a producer I've worked with. And I just sort of bounced the idea of, of starting a studio up that would be kind of more writer centric. Like what if, what if we went to, uh, you know, you want to go to writers who've been at it for a while, who are comfortable and confident in their abilities. Cause it is, a, there is a learning curve, but go to kind of established talent, go, what is your passion project? What is that TV show idea you had? You know, Matt, Matt Weiner, two years into trying to sell Mad Men as opposed to 10 years into trying to sell Mad Men. What's that one that keeps you up at night? Um, we will produce it. We will give you creative freedom. We will not develop it. Um, and you'll retain uh, ownership of it. And he loved the idea. And we ended up taking it to Warner Brothers um, and pitched them the idea. And uh, so, uh, and they and they went for it. So we now have a home. Um, our mandate is the first season. We're producing seven series for Warner Brothers. The idea is that um, Warner's will finance them and that Warner's has first shot uh, in success at turning these into TV shows or movies. And if not, then we're free and the, the creators are free to take them somewhere else. And along the way, and this is the bizarre part, um, it's a good friend of Steve's, a uh, gentleman I worked with several years before in a script that unfortunately never, never got made. Um, but it turned out Mick Jagger is a big fan of old time radio. And uh, um, so, so Mick became our partner. Uh, Mick and his producing partner, Victoria Perriman, uh, came on board and it, it remains, and I can't imagine topping this, the most surreal meeting I've ever been to when we went into pitch to Warner Brothers. The day before, um, Mick decided he wanted to come. Oh, and wow. <laughs> and some of the people at the meeting, I think, did not know he was coming. And so he showed up, and but it was still me pitching it. So it was basically me pitching the studio idea, and Mick Jagger's there to kind of to kind of go, yeah, all right, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> and uh, so we're we're off and running. Um, we've greenlit our first three series. Our series, um, one of them is Allison's, and uh, we are in the process of um, looking at looking at others. But it's a, it's an amazing. I, I love the format. I love the medium. And every writer we've talked to, when we sort of lay out how we're doing it, um, the first thing you tell them is there's virtually no money. And the second thing you tell them is you're going to have creative freedom and you don't really need to tell them anymore. And they're like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. So it's, um, it's kind of great. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Look forward to seeing the first one, seeing if, if Allison's ends up being the first one we, we hear. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Well, they're they're all off writing right now, so we will uh, we will see. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about here was just uh, turn the tables on you. You've been asking loads of people about their picks of the streams, like panning for gold in the streams. Yes, were, yes, and uh, give you a chance to like beat the algorithms because I think people are sick of of, of an algorithm telling them what to watch. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I've been, you know, my, my, my wife Nancy and I have been uh, watching a lot of movies and a lot of series. We started, before this began, we, we had started going back to Sopranos um, oh, okay. and, and finished them early into the quarantine, all 84 episodes, I think. <laughs> um, does that still hold up? I imagine it does. I, it doesn't just hold up. It, it yeah. exceeds your recollection. I mean, it's just so, there's so much, you know, there's a lot of different, shows that sort of helped usher in this new era, but nothing's more important than Sopranos, I think. Um, and I mean, I, I, avoided, I, would... I avoided that show for a while. Um, yeah. I finished. I'm like, I don't, why do I want to see a, a show glamorize these people, these awful people? And I fell in love with them within about two episodes. All of them. Yeah. Well, that's the great thing is he plays with that. You know, it's like you go three or four episodes and, they lull you into this sense of kind of moral complacency where you're like, Tony's a good guy. Carmela's just trying to make it. And then they just throw it in your face how utterly monstrous these people are, hmm. uh, which is such an interesting way to treat your audience, you know? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I, it's it's just fantastic. I, I'm, I'm more in awe of it now than I was uh, the first time I watched it all. Um, you know, and you sort of remember, oh, yeah, that season wasn't so, yeah, this season was all right. And then you watch them all and you're like, you know what? There was 10 minutes in one episode in the fourth season that wasn't up to par. 
but oh my god, that's you know, <laughs> it's so good. I'm giving um, it an A, you know, an A plus. That's oh no, no, A plus plus plus. Um, no, that, that, no, that one little bit where it dropped a bit. Yeah, exactly. You just so somehow you remember that more, you know, almost because it's such an aberration when the show isn't just hitting everything. Hmm. Um, and then we've done some stuff. Uh, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll recommend some stuff that you can find on streaming services, and then there's some stuff you might have to search. But um, we've been watching a lot of documentaries, and uh, we had Larry Wilmore on one of our we call them pandemic parades, um, the uh, the uh, the collections that we do, and he recommended a documentary that he had. Um, uh, he'd been on the documentary committee at Sundance, I guess, the year it came out, and they had given the award to this. It's a lovely film called Dina, uh, D-I-N-A. And it's about a woman who's, um, I mean, she's on the spectrum, and she's got some other issues, and it, it just follows her and the man she's involved with uh, romantically, who she's going to end up marrying over the course of the film. And it just follows them through their life leading up to their marriage and after. And it's simply a movie about, people communicating with, excuse me, with each other, just having conversations through their problems. And they have some big differences between them. I don't want to give anything away, but, um, and she has got some stuff in her past that slowly comes out. That's, that's kind of amazing and horrifying. And it's just incredible that she got through. And, you know, it just seems like the smallest movie in the world. And by the time you get to the end of it, it's just this gigantic, beautiful portrait of just two people who are, you know, so unique they're universal does that make sense it's like we're all different um and and struggling with their very specific unique issues in their relationship and yet in doing so kind of you know showing showing us all how to kind of get through this stuff um it's absolutely beautiful and we ended up the next day sort of i guess a little thematic consistency watching a doc on netflix um uh, dina i believe is on hulu uh, Tell Me Who I Am uh, on Netflix is a story of two identical twin brothers, one of whom was assaulted when he was 18 and woke up without any memory at all, but just remembers his identical twin. And they go through life with the one twin sort of feeding his memory to the other. And uh, as time goes by, the, the twin who lost his memory starts to realize there are things his brother is leaving out. And his brother is leaving them out for his own good, um, for the good of the brother who has no memory. But at the same time, you have to know who you are and where you come from. And it's an amazing film because it's about these two men, both of whom love each other dearly, both of whom have a bond that I think unless you're a twin, you probably can't understand. I know I don't. Um, who have this huge difference between them. Uh, both of them are correct in, in their assessment of the situation and in the problems that they're seeing uh, the situation is causing them. Um, and they have to, much like Dina, they have to sit down and talk and resolve their, their issues. And it's, it's shattering. Dina, Dina will leave you with a big smile. They'll both leave you with a smile. Tell me who I am will, will devastate you before it gets there. But it's, it's ultimately incredibly hopeful. And I think maybe it's, it's uh, the fact that, um, uh, you know, Nancy and I are locked up together in the house, that, that watching people kind of deal with just a two-person relationship uh, like adults and working their way through the problems is especially kind of uh, life-affirming right now. Uh, but just absolutely beautiful, beautiful docs. Um, the, uh, I also recently, for the show, um, she's coming up. We recorded it last week. The director, uh, writer-director Issa Lopez made a film called Tigers Are Not Afraid. Uh, she's a Mexican filmmaker. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago. It's, it's on Shutter. Um, it is technically a horror film. I wouldn't sell it as such to somebody who doesn't like horror, but, um, it's, it's got that kind of Guillermo del Toro sort of, you know, magical realism, tinges of darkness, but still sort of, it's, it's something else as well. And it's an absolutely beautiful film about, uh, kids on the streets of Mexico, um, dealing with, uh, um, drug lords around them and violence and, and loss and uh, through this kind of lens of a girl who may or may not be having uh, uh, connections to supernatural elements, or they may all be in her mind. Um, just absolutely beautiful kind of mythic film. Um, kind of reminded me, it's got elements of Night of the Hunter to it. So it's uh, okay. that, that kind of degree of... Um, How old is that film? You it's said about it's two or three years old. It's called Tigers Are Not Afraid. Uh, and then, oh, oh yeah. 
Yeah, it, that sounds um, recently watched um, Bunuel's uh, Los Ovidados. Yes, yes. It's, it's like Damned, is it? Yeah. That's what the translation is? Yes. That's a brutal film about that sort of street kids in, in Mexico City. And, yeah, yeah. East. Yeah, it's sort of that setting with a bit of a supernatural element in it, and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, okay, well, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, I saw the Bonwell film because one of our guests about a year ago, Gilbert Hernandez, recommended that. I had never seen it, and that's that's an amazing film, too. Yeah, I saw a clip of it years ago as a kid on an, an English uh, show, um, movie show, and it just captured me with the, where they beat up the old man. Yeah. And I've tried to track it down for ages and finally discovered it on, it's on Prime right yeah, now. Yeah, so yeah, it's not streaming somewhere. Yep. Yep, like, so, yeah, I watched it a few weeks ago. Amazing film. Yeah. So what, what's next on your list? Oh, I, what I want to recommend, I, we haven't watched it during the quarantine, but, but we watched it and it was on, and it keeps popping up uh, in my thoughts. Um, the Wachowskis did a TV show for Netflix called Sense8. Oh, uh, yes. Which is... You know, everybody I've talked to, and I think even we did at first, had the same issue. The first episode was so densely packed with information and characters. There, there's a sort of, you almost go, ah, I can't. But um, uh, if, if, you, if you stick with it, if you get, if you ignore that response, which I think is natural when you have so many characters coming at you, um, it's so rewarding. It's absolutely just gorgeous heartfelt um it's a genre thing it's science fiction it's about eight people all in different countries across the world who find that they're connected via some psychic ability and it's it's um you know it's it's a beautiful piece of work no matter what and netflix it's so bizarre to me because they obviously spent trillions of dollars on it because they shot on i think every continent and they're doing scenes on every continent where a character in Africa is looking in a mirror and having a conversation with somebody in England who's then turning around having a conversation with somebody who's in Sweden and they're covering every scene as though they're shooting them in a room but obviously having to do them months apart and I, just so much time and money uh, put into doing this and then it just it feels like when it came out there was like one billboard for it I, I don't understand the the mathematics of that but it lasted two seasons and then they let them do a sort of finale a two-hour movie that kind of wraps it up and it is it is a complete work in and of itself it's gorgeous um you know it's it's uh you know it's it's all about kind of empathy and understanding and and acceptance which are all great themes anytime but um you know a friend of mine pointed out that that you know it's what what makes it really relevant right now is you know it's it's kind of major plot devices people caring for and helping others in spite of great physical distances between them uh which seems to be kind of spot on for where we are right now but sense is just it's fantastic it's um it's beautiful it's loving it's sexy it's dark it's scary it's fun and ultimately it's it's hopeful and optimistic and just uh, it's in my virtual stack you know, yeah move I it up that. move it up you will you will not regret it it's uh reaction you said of of that first episode of like oh my god there's so much going on here yeah leaving it too long to get to the episode two and never getting to it yeah i tend to you know to me it's just like let let it wash over you because by the time you get to the end of the second season you'll be so immersed in it and so comfortable it it you'll, you'll be fine you'll be fine um it's it's wonderful the um there's a couple other things I've I've watched that have been kind of wonderful. There's a uh, a great Blu-ray set from Indicator called Five Tall Tales, which is a collection of Bud Bedecker westerns with Randolph Scott, which if you can get your hands on, they're just absolutely fantastic. Uh, who, I don't know who Bud Bedecker is. Bud Bedecker is a great, great, great American director of the 40s and 50s, did a ton of westerns with Randolph Scott. Um, just really lean, economic. I don't think any of these movies goes more than 80 minutes. Um, and they're really smart, really grown up, uh, but incredibly spare. Just, just beautiful, beautiful storytelling. And uh, Randolph Scott sort of past his what you might consider his prime. So he's sort of now kind of aging and and a little beat down, a little beat up, and sort of exploring the kind of more interesting, sort of darker, more adult sides of the character he played back when he was kind of a matinee idol. Um, but just, just great stuff. Um, there's a, the one I really want to hype because I, I couldn't find it anywhere streaming before I came on. I was like, with all this stuff, my hope is always like, you put it out in the universe, somebody will hear you. Uh, there's a wonderful film um, from the uh, um, late 80s, uh, Pow Wow Highway, um, directed by Jonathan Wax. Uh, it's it's um, 
just an incredible film. Uh, it's it's um, A. Martinez is one of the leads. The um, oh my god, I'm blanking on the name of the lead. He's a great character actor. Um, Gary Farmer, who you've seen in a million things, he's he's in Dead Man with um, Johnny Depp, and it's just a small story about a couple of guys living on an Indian reservation in the Southwest um, who have to go on a road trip together, and it's it's just beautiful. It is I. Yeah. I found it for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you found it streaming? Yep. It's on the Criterion channel. It's on, cri- it's on Criterion? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. I, I imagine just streaming. I don't think it's on the on DVD or CD. Yeah, no, no, it's not. Oh, it's, it's so good. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, uh, yeah, we watched an old DVD of it. and um, uh, my wife Maybe it's a new it. edition. Yeah, it's, um, it's so good. I, I usually go to Just Watch. Do you know that site? Uh, no. Oh, is that the one where you plug in everything? And there's like 20 of those. I didn't use yeah. Just Watch. I should have. <laughs> Justwatch.com. Uh, thanks to my colleague, Matt Warren, for that. Um, it seems to be really up to date. I don't know if they somehow tied it in with all the streaming sites. But... Well, look up. Okay, then my last one. Oh, yeah. this, is more, this is more of a recommendation of a, of a website than, than an actual film. But well, look up Mooch Goes Hollywood. So a, a movie. Yeah. Yeah. From the seventies written by Jim Bachman, Jim Bacchus, uh, directed by Richard Erdman, who was a great character actor narrated by Zsa Zsa Gabor. It's, uh, about an hour long. It's about a dog that goes to Hollywood. Um, it's on prime. Yeah. It's, it's on prime. Okay, great. It's absolutely batshit insane. Um, and i I do a thing. You know, I'm a screenwriter. There's no structure in my life on any kind of regular basis for 20 some years now. Um, I've been doing a regular movie night at my house every Wednesday. Uh, same bunch of idiots come over. We have dinner, we have a drink, and we watch a movie together. And obviously, since all this began, we had to kind of change our plans. And I found a service, a website called Watch Together, Watch Number Two Together, that allows you to um, essentially watch movies together over the Internet. There's a lot of services like this. Um, and it's got a thing down the side where you can comment uh, and we've been um, continuing to do movie night, but the way to make it feel communal is you have to engage. So you don't want to show movies. You know, I'm not going to show Tigers Are Not Afraid. It's a very serious film. You, you want to show movies that kind of demand to, um, Joe, Joe Dante hates this, but there are movies that demand to be talked through. <laughs> so we watch stuff like Mooch Goes to Hollywood and then people sort of, you know, get drunker and drunker and make wise ass comments down the side. And it is not the same thing as being in a room with a bunch of your friends watching a movie, but it's a nice approximation for the time being. And I can't tell you uh, how, how lovely it is to have something like that at a time like this. So don't, don't worry so much about Mooch. Although if you can find it, watch it. It's pretty insane. Amazon Prime. Yeah. And I've yeah. just checked. I, I, oh, okay. <laughs> it said it on Just Watch, but I checked on Prime and it's here. Fantastic. So Justwatch.com is a very reliable source. Um, I think a lot of movies, if you've seen them, if everyone's seen them, it's good to talk over them, talk through them for the second or third time. I, I, it's not worth doing it for those labyrinthine, you know, complicated sure. mysteries or something that no one's seen. But. Yeah. In fact, I'm, I'm trying, we're still working on some of the tech angles, but we're doing a, um, uh, there's a, there's an insane movie I love called The Apple, which uh, I talked about over on Trailers from Hell many years ago. The, and... Um, Every year I show it to a bunch of friends who've never seen it. And I had some friends who were going to watch it with me this year, but now they're stuck in New York. And so forth. So I'm doing a, um, we're going to do an actual screening of this thing, which is a movie that you, you can't remain silent through. Um, I've got a couple of friends from some comedy podcast who are going to watch it with me and we're going to record it and we're going to put it out there and use it to raise funds for the, uh, the, the Hollywood Food Coalition again, because, you know, might as well, might as well give it some sort of socially redeeming value, I think. Do you want to say anything more about it? The Apple was directed by Menachem Golan from Canon Films. It was made in 1980. It is, um, it's an insane rock musical that looks forward uh, far into the future, into 1994, um, and, and posits a world that is run by one gigantic satanic record company. And it's about a, 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 a young folk duo who come to the big city and are corrupted by uh, the, the evil... Um, uh, the evil record company. And it's 
it's just bonkers. You can't believe what you're looking at. And it's really fun every now and then to stop and remember that actually 1994 was the year that Nirvana broke and imagine what, you know, what the real world was looking like in the time that this film is trying to transcribe. But um, it is, it is a delight. It never stops entertaining. And that is on Amazon Prime too. That's on Amazon Prime too. Everything is. God, I, I just, I need to say it. I mean, I have it. One of the most evil companies in the world, but but they are getting us through this with their stupid goddamn Prime, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I think they need a better algorithm because there's some real gems from yeah. the 80s and 70s there. There's a ton of spaghetti westerns that yep. are not, um, you know, not the famous ones. A lot of a lot of seventies cop movies I'd never heard of. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, and a lot of Italian giallo yep. films are on there, and they never pop up in my feed. I have to sort of dig for you know an old, like an old you know the original Suspiria, and then it all sort of pops yeah. Up. And you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes the quality is almost unwatchable. And then we just watched this insane movie from the seventies called City on Fire, not the Ringo Lamb one, but an American dis- or Canadian disaster film with Barry Newman and Henry Fonda and Ava Gardner that is just lunacy. And it's a beautiful HD master of it that they have on Amazon Prime. I have no idea why. City on Fire. Barry Newman. I've yeah, the great Barry Newman. He was Petrocelli, wasn't he? Yes, yes. He never finished that house. <laughs> <laughs> it's also also a vanishing point. And, uh, That's right. No, uh, uh, yeah, he was in a... For, for people listening, uh, like, uh, was he a private investigator or a lawyer? TV I think player? Petrocelli was a lawyer, I yeah. think. Yeah. And it, it, every episode ended up with him going back home. And like, I don't know where he lived in a, was it a caravan or something? But he was building a house. One, and it's like one right. brick a week. Was yeah, added. just so this recurring, house. right. Building his dream house. And also, I got to say, my, my, one of my favorite moments in The Limey, which is just an exquisite film. And by the way, if you haven't seen The Limey, go stream that. I'm sure it's somewhere, Steven Soderbergh. Um, is it's got all these 70s icons in it and uh, 60s and 70s icons. And Barry Newman plays Peter Fonda's lawyer. Um, and Barry, Fonda, uh, Barry Newman, of course, starred in uh, Vanishing Point, which is one of the great yes. car chase movies of all time. And there's a moment, it's just out of the blue, when uh, Barry Newman has to get in a car and chase Terrence Stamp. And just, you know, the instant he gets behind the wheel, he's just the most amazing driver ever. And it's like, yes, he's back. It's a fantastic film. Um. We're about uh, time for questions. So oh, okay. Submit questions. Um, uh, someone, it's on Criterion as a double bill, Mido saying. I, ah, the Limey. Mido oh. reference, what we're talking about. The Limey. Um, yeah, answer, put, put the answer in the, in the Q&A, Mido, so we know what he's talking about. Um, uh, any last picks before we go to questions? No, 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 let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, so uh, Mido again says he, uh, he's a firm believer that an adaptation is not beholden to its source material and must simply capture its essence. Can you talk a little bit about the process of, of adaptation from your perspective, uh, perhaps drawing on history of violence as an example? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all different, you know, sometimes, sometimes, um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever adapted anything the same way, which is kind of fun. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm doing a, doing a book right now where I'm, I'm, almost transcribed sort of breaking down some chapters that I want to use and then almost transcribing them into present tense for like the first draft of the script. Cause it's so exquisite and cinematic. Um, I adapted a short story by Dennis Lehane. That was this incredible piece called until Gwen, um, all told in second person, uh, and very, um, very subjective, very moody, very, uh, there's not a lot of plot details. Um, and so I had to kind of, find a way to literalize a lot of what was going on. And, and yet, to me, the bottom line was still be completely true to the story he was telling. Um, I felt real loyalty to that. And uh, then Dennis, Dennis was thrilled with how it came on and uh, how it came out. So I, I, I guess I pulled that off. But but it really was a radical translation from one to the other while holding on to the essence. And then sometimes you, you, you don't worry about that so much. Um, History of Violence was a graphic novel that I had read a couple of years before um, getting approached about the job. And uh, it, I loved the title. I loved the central premise. Um, and as I kept reading the book, it, it um, you know, it's an interesting story. It just, I remember feeling like it was one of those things I kept reading where I kept going, oh, God damn it. If I'd been writing this, I would have done this instead. 
so when the opportunity came up to um, adapt it, I kind of took that approach so that it, it bears much similarity to the graphic novel in terms of plot. By the time you're done, we were dealing with sort of radically different themes and ideas, um, and it had sort of deviated greatly. It's like as the film goes on, it gets farther and farther away from the book. And that was one where I was just kind of shamelessly not concerning myself with, you know, the intent of the book and kind of more just like what, what's the story I would have told if I'd been clever enough to come up with these sort of core ideas. But they're, they're really all different, I think. There's sometimes, you know, some things demand that you be faithful to them and others demand that you just are merciless in your approach. And it's just a matter of kind of figuring that out on a case by case basis, I think. What is it then that that dictates that in in a in a novel you think that, that requires you to be faithful versus like go off and just capture the the tone or the feel of the book but not worry about it? yeah I mean that's a good question you know I think when it's something that's um, so plot heavy you know History of Violence was was a just a very plot oriented book um, it I think becomes fair game for taking the pieces and, and moving them around to do something a little, uh, a little different. Um, you know, think of, um, uh, um, oh, oh my God, it goes my brain. Uh, Robert Aldrich's Mickey Splane. Uh, it's embarrassing. I'm supposed to be the guy who, who's seen every movie. Um, the Ralph Meeker film with the, uh, the money in a suitcase. The glow, um, the glow yeah. The, uh, yeah, that's called, um, God damn it. Hang on. I'm typing it in. I'm losing my mind here. Kiss me deadly. Yes. Uh, always happens. Yes, we're live. Josh yeah. is going to forget the name of one of his favorite movies. Um, but that's a thing where, you know, they took uh, Aldrich and um, his writer clearly were not fans of Mickey Spillane and um, were not fans of Mike Hammer. They thought he was a malignant thug and but saw a great movie in there. And you know, the adaptation is relatively faithful to the plot, but the intent and the tone and everything else is just completely different from what Spillane intended. And I think that almost came out of a contempt for the material. So, you know, and it, and it is easily the best Mickey Spillane adaptation. There's no question. Mm-hmm. Um, I love it for its sense of place as well. It's yeah. Like, it's not yeah. LA that you don't see anymore. Yes. Yeah, very, very much so. And I also love just for no reason he's got, what is it, like the mid-50s, and he's got an answering machine. He's got a giant reel-to-reel answering machine on his wall. It's the coolest thing you'll ever see. But, and, you know, and an ending, that, like, who would have the guts to pull off an ending? I couldn't believe yes. an ending like that. that's just totally sort of nihilistic. Yes, absolutely. Without giving it away to people. Without giving anything away. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, but I, I don't know how to answer that question. I think it's just sort of, you, you know, you know what to do when you see it and you have to sort of trust with anything. You have to trust your creative instinct. It could be completely wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, it could have been disastrous to have, uh, uh, sort of warped the plot for history of violence as much as they did. Um, but you have to kind of just trust those instincts. It, like, what, what's your first sort of step in kind of like breaking the back of a story? <sighs> It's, it's all, again, always different, you know, with, um, uh, with, with history. I, I had read the book once when it came out, once when I was sort of breaking out my pitch to get the job. And I don't think I ever looked at it again after that. Um, with others, uh, you know, you sit there with the book at your side. When I was doing the Dennis Lehane thing, I like, I constantly had the story. I was just sort of referring to it just for kind of sort of the vibe of it, the tone of it, uh, with the thing I'm doing now, I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm, literally sitting here with pages from the novel where I have circled stuff with a highlighter and like, you know, we're using this scene and going back and forth. But again, it's all sort of on a, on a, you know, a case by case basis, how, how intimately involved with the material you are when you're writing it. Uh, a question from an anonymous, uh, are there any programs or festivals you would recommend to writers starting out? And thanks for being here, Josh. Um, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for watching. Um, I'm terrible about that stuff. I, 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 I don't, uh, there's a lot of great film festivals. I'm, I, uh, uh, I tend to be kind of cynical about, um, sort of screenplay, uh, uh, contests and organizations. And I know there are some good ones, but, um, I, I probably shouldn't say anything on the subject cause I'll probably end up smearing the ones who are good or elevating one that's bad, but it's just sort of not, um, not a world I'm that familiar with. I would also recommend just, to, uh, you know, Filmmaker Labs, like the Film Independent Screenwriting Lab, uh, apply to that. And uh, 
Okay. Nichols is a big one, of course. Yes, yeah, I've got friends who've, who've um, judged for that and speak very highly of it. Um, you know, I, I don't know, man. For me, it's it's uh, um, you know, it's it's just a matter. And I also don't I don't know what the world is right now for screenwriters who are trying to break in. It's so radically different from when I came in. Um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, sort of how to get there and how to how to how to get good at the job. I mean, it seems to me that, that the best thing you can do is um, watch a lot of movies, study them, read screenplays if you enjoy them. I, I personally, I, I find the form hideous. <laughs> uh, but but um, I think reading, you know, read, read literature, read books. Um, it's so important to just sort of uh, uh, feed that beast, you know, as, as you're going. And I know there are, you know, a lot, a lot of screenwriters sort of take a different tactic, but I think first and foremost, as a screenwriter, you're a writer. And, and that demands kind of constantly exposing yourself to great writing in all kinds of different medium. Do you have go-to yeah. screenplays that you always recommend people read? I, you know, I, I, I two, two that I love um, and mostly, you know, it's like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I ever learn anything from them. They're just such a joy to read, but the Coen brothers Miller's crossing is just, oh. I, I mean, you know, they're, they're gods. And um, Walter Hill, who I'm, I'm proud to say my friend Walter Hill's, uh, his draft of Alien is, I read that a million years ago. It was, it was revelatory. It's, um, Walter was one of the, the key uh, movers and shakers in, in screenwriting, who I think sort of helped transition the form into kind of the more modern version um, where uh, less is more. I mean, his, his scripts, it's the word that always comes up with him, but it's like his scripts are like haiku, you know, just the most bare bones description to get across what you need. And then this great dialogue and, you know, he's never wasted a word in his life, which uh, is something I just revere. Every time I think I'm a lean writer, I read one of Walter's scripts. And it's like, shit. What makes his draft of aliens so uh, special? It's just, it's beautifully tight. It's economical. It's, um, it's moody. It's even just nice to look at. I can't even describe it, but just this, it, it, but it, but it gets across kind of the loneliness and despair these characters are facing. Um, and, and, uh, it's just got this kind of hard boiled sensibility, which, which translated into the film. Um, that's beautiful. It's funny because if you only know Walter through kind of, you know, his, his crime stuff and his Westerns, uh, I remember he was a kid. I was like, what, Walter Hill doing a science fiction movie? And then, then you see it and it's like, it all kind of makes sense, but um, it's, it's there on the page. It's a, it's a beautiful draft. I think The Driver is one of the most underrated movies from the 70s. And yeah, people down. did not understand it, you know? It's like now everybody, you know, now you, you got Quentin Tarantino spent 20 years making genre films with an art house sensibility. It's like everyone takes it for granted now. It's like, oh, yeah, that stuff. But, yeah, people were not prepared for The Driver. That was, that was you know, that was a guy who loved crime movies who had uh, also loved, you know, the French New Wave going, yeah. Right. He doesn't even bother to give his protagonist and antagonist a name right now it's who needs a who needs a, oh. yeah which i always love that i always love that because how many times when you've seen a movie and someone asks you to describe it do you go you know do you refer to the name of the character it's like yeah it's leonardo DiCaprio. he's running around he's dreaming and he's falling into these buildings it's like who needs yeah. names who needs names <laughs> uh we have time for a few more questions if you haven't submitted a question use the q a button at the bottom uh patrick uh says love Bronzeville. Do you think audio dramas will provide opportunity for disabled actors and diverse casting? What does directing an audio drama entail? Yeah, I mean, um, I can answer some of that. Yeah, I think it will provide tremendous opportunity. I think I haven't even thought about it, but sure. To say, yeah, because look, pod podcasts are the medium by which we can eventually get to a world where people like me can start complaining that there are too many disabled people playing abled people, you know, because <laughs> all you need is a voice. Um, I think that's wonderful, actually. I hadn't thought of that. Um, in terms of di diversity, yeah, it, it's, it's. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, as, as much as film and TV can and should, um, I think one of the nice things about podcasting is that there's, uh, you know, the audio drama is that um, there's less pressure to deliver a massive audience so you can start zeroing in a little more on kind of specific localized communities and 
um, which which will automatically kind of open the doors to to uh, one would hope kind of more diverse voices. Uh, obviously, it's something we're we're aiming for with the studio. Um, you know, looking looking to tell stories about um, people and places that don't uh, get as much exposure as they should. Uh, which just for me, setting aside any politics, um, it's just aren't we tired of the same stories about the same people? I'm, I'm you know. <laughs> You don't, you don't go to the same restaurant and order the same meal every day. Why? Well, I do, but you know, <laughs> I'm a terrible eater, man. You don't want to go there, but but yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's. I I recognize this early on in life. It was just like, you know, I'm 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 a straight white man in America. If I want to see some glorious rendition of of the most idealized version of me, I just turn on the TV and there's a billion of them, you know, and and that gets boring fast. It's like there's. Uh, um, you know, and not a lot of people know that, but know this, but, but there are other people outside of the world, outside of people who look like you and me. And it's, they have stories too. Crazy idea. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, and I, I really do. I think, I think one of the nice things about uh, podcasting is it's going to, um, just sort of naturally allow for, for more diversity. Um, Eric says if you had only one piece and he stresses one piece, uh, of advice to give an aspiring screenwriter, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, the greatest ever, the greatest ever, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, and it's three words. And, um, you know, you should you should spend every morning spending maybe five minutes just meditating on this. Uh, pity the reader. Um, just always pity the reader. You know, take to, just think about the poor son of a bitch who's got to read what you're writing and um, do everything you can to uh, um, to reward them for that and as little as you can to, pen up to punish them. That, 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 that advice is, has done me well over the years. I was lucky enough to hear Kurt Vonnegut live. He came to my university to give a talk. Oh, wow. Uh, at the very sort of end of his career. And he did his Shape of Stories. Have you seen that? Sorry, you broke up. His what stories? The Shape of Stories. Have you ever seen that? No, no, I haven't. It's a, it's a sort of a, it's a bit, but it's very funny where he says every story has a line and it's sort of on the ha time versus happiness scale. Uh -huh. And there's a, at least one or two recordings of these on YouTube. You should check them out. It's mm. very funny. I will. I mean, he, he was absolutely brilliant, obviously. So. Um, Mido asks, are any of your scripts out there in the, People, where people can read them officially? Um, officially, not so much. I know he, he, history pops up on a bunch of those websites where people put those things up, and um, um, I never know. Sometimes I, there's only two drafts of the script. There's the uh, first one I wrote, then there's the one we shot, which was um, my rewrite. And uh, um, if you can, I always recommend the uh, rec recommend the shooting one because um, you know when when I first wrote it, it was like. Uh, it, it's it's a little more kind of a little more sort of genre action packed. Uh, the first draft is when when David came on, we spent a lot of time talking and um, uh, got to bring out kind of some of the more interesting ideas of the thing. Um, so I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of the second. I'm, I'm a fan of both of them. I'm very proud of them. But the second draft is the one to is the one to get a hold of. Um, they're out there on websites. And a friend, somebody just sent me a message the other day that. A script I wrote with a friend a thousand years ago called Black Water, which is about underwater vampires, is floating around out there somehow. I have no idea how or where. Um, I'm not even sure I have it anymore. I'm sure if I opened the file, it would be unreadable. But, but um, uh, that's that's pretty much it. I've been thinking about. Uh, I've got a script I wrote with a friend that we can never, we'll never be able to get made that we're thinking of putting out and just letting letting the world have it. And that's all I'm going to say on the subject for now. But. <laughs> Pilot, please read my effing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, here we go. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. How, how was Cronenberg to work with? Uh, he was great. He was great. He was an amazing collaborator. Um, he, uh, he, he's an elegant man. Yeah, he really is. And you know, when he came in, I remember our first conversation. He's like, "Look, I want to, I want to do this movie that you've written, and I want to help make it the best thing that it can be." And and um, you know, the, the, he, came, he came to town for a week and we sat in a hotel room and just went through the script page by page. And then I went off and wrote. And um, it, it, was, it was just, it was wonderful. Um, it was an amazing experience. And uh, he had a real knack for sort of finding, finding the problems and solving them and 
um, I just remember like the first, literally the first, I've talked about this at length, but um, literally the first thing he said to me, there was a character in the script that uh, actually one of the studio executive had kind of convinced me to put in, which was a father for the Maria Bello character who has his own, God help me, history of violence. And I did my best with it, but it, it always it always bugged me and I couldn't quite put into words. And literally the first time we sat down, David said, okay, we're cutting the father. Um, he's he's all about theme. There's nothing else to him but theme. And I was like, that's it. That's exactly the problem. But I think he was also challenging me to see, you know, okay, here we are, day one of our professional relationship. I'm going to tell this guy we're going to cut one of the major characters. How's he going to react to that? And, um, you know, my reaction is like, yeah, a good note's a good note. And if that right. good note is coming from one of the greatest directors alive, all the better. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was it was just a blast. Uh, he also made one of the, I think, greatest twin movies ever. Dead yeah, Dead Ringers, yes. Yeah, immensely disturbing film. Yeah. Beautifully uh, directed. I, I just found out recently that Jeremy Irons had two different, he plays identical twins in the film. He had two different dressing rooms. <laughs> which makes so much sense it's it's you know if there's actors watching this they're sitting there going well yeah sure but yeah when he was playing one brother he went into hair and makeup in this place and when he was playing the other brother he did it over here and it worked well we are out of time thank ah. you so much josh for this it's been fantastic uh you've given me a long list of you know obscure crazy bonkers 80s excellent <laughs> Um, this has been a coffee talk with Film Independent. Uh, check us out at filmindependent.org. Um, membership is um, open for, to all, and we have a special running right now. Sign up for a year's membership and get two months extra for free, 14 months for the price of 12. Uh, but I'm Paul Cowling saying thank you for joining us, and thank you, Josh Olson, for being here. Thank you, Paul. It was a pleasure. Let's do this again soon. You take care. Yes, you too. <laughs>